Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Angie Rogers. I'm the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Economic Development for Prince George's County. Uh, and we are going to get started uh, in just a few seconds uh, with our second conversation uh, regarding rent stabilization uh, in Prince George's County. We'll just give it a few seconds uh, for attendees to get logged in. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I think we will get started. Uh, so again, I am uh, Angie Rogers. I am the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Economic Development uh, for Prince George's County. Uh, and thank you for tuning in uh, to this second conversation uh, regarding rent stabilization um, in Prince George's County. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, the Prince George's County Council earlier this year uh, passed two bills, uh, CB7 and CB51, uh, to uh, set and then clarify a policy for rent stabilization uh, in Prince George's County. Uh, the agreement um, between the administration and the council also at the time uh, was to set a work group uh, that would spend uh, roughly the next year uh, digging into this issue um, more in depth uh, in order to devise a permanent uh, rent stabilization policy uh, for the county. That work group uh, has been convened. Uh, they will begin uh, their work officially uh, in the uh, weeks to come. Uh, but before they officially began their work, we wanted to do uh, these fact-finding uh, discussions uh, to allow specifically our work group members to hear from experts in the field um, who have experience uh, with rent stabilization from a number of different sides. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we heard a uh, presentation from representatives from uh, the Urban Institute uh, and also ULI Minnesota on sort of local and national best practices uh, related to rent stabilization. Tonight, we are going to hear uh, from another dynamic panel um, focused on tenant impact. Uh, tonight, we have with us uh, Jessica Kinkosa and Kayla Williams Campbell from Community Legal Services of Prince George's County. We also have with us Erica Puentes Martinez and Jorge Benitez uh, from Casa de Maryland. Uh, so, we will hear presentations from both of those groups. Uh, in between those presentations, uh, we will take a couple of minutes to take uh, clarifying questions uh, from members of the work group. Uh, and then the second half of our time tonight will be uh, a more general discussion uh, and work group members uh, will have the ability to, to ask more general questions of our panel. Uh, thank you to the members of the public uh, who have logged in uh, this evening. Uh, this uh, a discussion, uh, as I said, is really for fact finding and the ability for our work group to start to dig into this topic uh, and start to frame the discussion that they will have over the next year. Um, but the uh, members of the public can certainly interact with us tonight uh, through the chat, uh, through the Q&A. We do plan to, uh, over the course of the work group's uh, work, 
uh, have some additional sessions uh, that will be more sort of town hall style um, that will allow the public to weigh in um, uh, directly with us. Uh, so that's our lineup for this evening. Before we get started, I want to hand it over uh, to Coney Serrano Portillo, uh, who is going to welcome you on behalf of our esteemed uh, District 7 Council Member, uh, Council Member Crystal, Crystal Oriada. Coney? Thank you, Angie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, the Council Member could not join us tonight, but she did want to send her regards. Um, and just say thank you to CASA and Community Legal Services for tonight's presentations. Uh, we're very excited to hear from all of you, um, as we know that renters and families um, have been highly impacted by rent increases um, all across the county. So we're excited for this session and all the great things that will come out of the work group. And we're, we're um, hoping to also see you tomorrow at the Landlord and Development Impact Session. So thank you so much. I'll kick it back to Angie. Thank you so much, Coney. So we are going to get started uh, with our representatives from Community Legal Services. Uh, and I'll invite you all to uh, pull your presentation up uh, and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Kinkosa. I'm the Executive Director of Community Legal Services. And I have the task of uh, moving the slideshow along for Kayla, who graciously created the slideshow. And I'm here to answer any questions. Um, give me one second. and. Kayla, if you want to introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kayla Williams Campbell. I'm a managing attorney with Community Legal Services, and I oversee our eviction prevention programs. We currently have two eviction prevention programs, one in Prince George's County that operates out of the Hyattsville District Courthouse, and we also have an eviction prevention program at the Anne Arundel, um, in Anne Arundel County that provides representation um, in the Glen Burnie and Annapolis District Courts. Both of our programs focus on providing free representation to low-income and underserved tenants who are facing eviction. And so tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about rent stabilization, how it impacts tenants, and why we believe it's important, but also why tenants um, believe it's important. I'm going to just go through a little bit about what is rent stabilization, as well as some of the numbers um, in terms of eviction filings and why these policies are important, particularly in Prince George's County. So first, um, I would like to talk about what is rent stabilization. Um, I know that rent stabilization and rent control are, are often used interchangeably. However, rent stabilization, these policies allow for certain rent increases um, for a fixed amount. So um, currently Prince George's County has passed rent, stabiliz rent stabilization bills that allow for a 3% increase, whereas rent control would provide that a landlord cannot um, raise rent past a certain amount. So um, it's intended to protect tenants from price gouging um, and make housing more affordable. So I'm sure that all of you have witnessed what's been happening throughout the pandemic. Um, it's like as soon as the um, as soon as those pandemic moratoriums lifted, a lot of tenants experienced extreme rent increases. And so I'm next going to talk about. Um, the two bills that have passed by the county, or that have been passed by the county, and then we'll go into why um, it's important for tenants. So CB 7 2023, this is the first um, rent stabilization act that was passed by the county. This prohibits landlords from increasing a tenant's rent by more than 3%. Um, this legislation is temporary, so it will expire after a year. Um, and there are certain exceptions that do apply. And I think these exceptions are important to talk about because they could possibly um, preclude a lot of tenants from being able to take advantage of the Rent Stabilization Acts. So again, um, according to this legislation, landlords cannot increase rent by more than 3% within a given year. Um, however, there's exceptions. So if the tenant um, is living in an affordable housing, that is um, backed by federal, state, or local subsidies, this stabilization act would not apply to them. Additionally, if the tenant is living in a dwelling unit and they've received, they're currently receiving rental assistance, it also would not apply to them. Um, if the tenant is living in a unit that is um, providing affordable housing to low income or 
uh, moderate income households, it would not apply to them. And lastly, um, if the landlord has obtained a use and occupancy permit within the last five years, this act would not apply to them. And so I think the most important in terms of us representing tenants, I think the most important um, exception would be that this act does not apply to certain tenants who are receiving rental assistance. Um, because a lot of our, our clients, a lot of tenants that we represent are low income and they are currently facing rental assistance. I'm sorry, they are currently seeking or have recently obtained rental assistance. And there is an enforcement authority. Um, so if a landlord does not abide by um, these rent stabilization bills, I'm sorry, Jessica, can you go back? Thank you. Um, if the um, landlords are not abiding by the rent stabilization bills, um, they can be, they can face fines. So they could face a fine of $500 for the first violation. And they could also face a $1,000 fine for any subsequent, subsequent violations. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the second Rent Stabilization Act that was passed in Prince George's County is CB, CB 51 2023. This particular legislation prohibits landlords from retaliating against tenants um, due to, or retaliate, I'm sorry, retaliating against tenants um, who seek enforcement of CB 7 2023. So for example, if a tenant um, believes that their rent has been illegally raised more than 3%, they can report their landlord to the county um, or they can consult an attorney to get legal advice. If the landlord then threatens to say terminate their lease or um, you know, um, reduce some of their services like turn off their water, turn off their electricity, um, fail, uh, fail to provide lack of maintenance, all of these things are considered retaliatory under this act. So what happens is um, if a tenant is being retaliated against, this particular act provides them a recourse. And I believe that the enforcement authority is still DPI, the Department of um, Permitting Inspections and Enforcement. And it's for our purposes, of course, if a tenant were to um, face a court summons or an eviction hearing, we could also provide representation um, in court and raise certain defenses in regards to those illegal rent increases. So again, CB 51 2023 provides tenants with a remedy for if they are being retaliated against for um, in terms of the Rent Stabilization Act. So again, if the landlord is harassing the tenants, if they're threatening to file an eviction, if the tenant doesn't pay illegal fees or if they're decreasing services, um, all of those things could be retaliation and could give the tenant a recourse. It's important to note though that the same exceptions or exemptions from CB 7 2023, they also apply to um, CB 51. So if the tenant has received rental assistance or if they're living in certain um, government backed properties, they this may not apply to them. So now that we've talked about um, the bills that the county has passed, I would like to talk about why rent stabilization is important um, for tenants. And next slide. Thank you, Jessica. So why is it needed? Um, so for one, Prince George's County has always or notoriously had pretty high rent. Um, it seems to have gotten higher throughout the pandemic. Um, but in addition to the rent already being high, towards the end of the pandemic, we started to see a lot of landlords increasing tenants' rent significantly. Um, we've seen rents be increased as much as um, $400. In some cases, I think we've even seen a tenant's rent be increased by $600, um, oftentimes with little notice. So a tenant's lease may be nearing expiration. And in order to renew that lease, they may then have to pay um, an astronomical um, rent increase of $400, $500, $600. That's on the higher end, of course, but we did start to see that a lot. Additionally, a lot of our tenants were already um, burdened by the financial hardships that the pandemic brought about. So a lot of tenants were um, facing job loss, they were facing illness, they were being caregivers, 
And for those reasons, um, I know they were already falling behind trying to catch up. A lot of them were seeking rental assistance. And now that rental assistance is somewhat dwindling, um, it may not be guaranteed in the long run. It's even more important for um, these bills to um, be, in, be in place. And additionally, um, inflation has affected um, everyone in, in everything, including groceries and gas. And because of the rising costs, many tenants are being priced out of not only renting, but also home ownership. And we're concerned that if there are not rent stabilization policies and certain caps in which landlords cannot um, increase rent, we're concerned that it could increase homelessness and it could cause a mass exodus out of the county. Um, and as I mentioned, um, rental assistance, although it is still available, we anticipate that it will decrease at some point um, in the near future. We're hoping that it is um, um, put in the budget, but that is a concern that we're also looking at. Um, majority of the tenants that we represent, we're starting to see less defenses. Um, a lot of the tenants just need assistance paying their rent. So if these laws are not in place, then the concern is, although the tenant may receive rental assistance, they then, although they may catch up then, they can't continue to pay the increased costs of the increased rent. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to note that there's no state law that talks about rent increases or stabilization. So um, the Maryland um, Real Property Code says nothing about um, how much a landlord in Maryland can or cannot raise the rent. So they leave it up to the individual min municipalities and counties. So that's why it's important for the counties to, to, um, to look at this legislation and analyze how it can impact the tenants that are living in their, um, their areas. And again, with no rent stabilization policies, landlords are allowed to increase rent in any amount. Um, that's what we were seeing prior to the rent stabilization um, acts being passed. And additionally, um, a lot of times when rent is increased, you may not all you may not always be or those increases may not always be reflected in the actual property. So what we also see is a lot of times tenants rent will be increased, you know, 200 $300, but there will be no um, upgrades to the home. There's lack of maintenance, continued maintenance issues. Um, safety issues. Um, a lot of we've. I, I know there's been some um, some press about some um, some properties in Prince George's County who have had a lot of maintenance issues. Well, we're concerned that even if the landlords increase the rent, we may not see that rent being or that increase actually impacting the tenants positively. They may not actually be receiving the the maintenance that they've been um, concerned about all this time. And lastly, um, we're concerned that lack of rent stabilization will result in the continued increase in eviction filings. On the next few slides, I'll include some statistics that are, um, we're actually, yes, I'll talk about eviction filings in Prince George's County and why it's so important, particularly in this county that we have some type of rent stabilization um, legislation in place. So Prince George's County, has, I believe, the second highest um, eviction filings in the state of Maryland. Um, we're preceded by Baltimore County, I believe. And I'm focusing on fair to pay rent cases because those are the cases that mainly involve rent. And so um, why are filings so high in, in the county? Um, for one, if you look at the cost to live in Prince George's County, that's, that's one factor you have to consider. Um, additionally, it's extremely cheap to file a fair to pay rent case. So it's only $15 to file it. And so that's essentially giving landlords no incentive to not file. Um, but additionally, a lot of landlords, we believe a lot of landlords use fair to pay rent cases as a debt collection measure. So unfortunately, we'll see some tenants who are being summoned every single month because they are having trouble catching up. Um, and although they're seeking rental assistance, you know, that's a process. And so um, I think that's a reason why some of the filings are so high. And additionally, the demographic and socioeconomic factors. Um, statistically, Black um, people and Black women in particular are more likely to be evicted. And if you look at Prince George's County, I know um, we're very diverse, but demographically, there are a lot of 
um, people of color, a lot of black women and a lot of black people in general. So that's another reason why we believe that the filings are so high. And on the next slide, I just prepared a, actually um, these statistics, these filing statistics came from the Maryland courts website. So as you can see in fiscal year 20, so that was right before the pandemic. So from July, 2019 through July, 2020, you can see there were 111,000 filings um, just for failure to pay rent. As you can see the other cases, there's, there's, very, there's pretty small amounts of them. Um, tenant holding over is when a landlord's alleging that a tenant's lease is expired. Um, and as a result, they want them, them to move. Breach of lease, wrongful detainer, um, those are pretty straightforward. But as you can see, the failure to pay rent case filings are extremely high. That was before the pandemic and right when we got into the pandemic. Of course, in fiscal year 21, so that's from July 2020 through June 2021, um, filing rates went down because at that time we had a lot of moratoriums and protections in place. So this prevented, um, this allowed certain tenants to raise defenses that may not have otherwise been available. So if they were facing financial hardships that were caused by the pandemic, they could um, raise that in court. And so we saw a reduction in um, fiscal year 21. However, we are starting to see a significant increase um, as of fiscal year 22. And of course, we're still continuing to see that increase. So as you can see in fiscal year 21, there were 52,000 fair to pay rent cases filed. And then in fiscal year 22, there were 70,000 cases filed. And also, as you can see, um, the tenant holding over cases have gradually increased every year. So that's another concern um, is that when, you know, during the pandemic, the pandemic lasted over a year, of course, over two years, essentially. And so landlords, we're just saying, you know what, we're not going to file the fair to pay rent cases because there's protections available, but we're just going to file tenant holding over cases because the tenant's lease has expired. And as a result, we want them out. But one concern with tenant holding over cases is that the landlords um, can tell the tenant your lease is expiring and will allow you to renew. But if if you wanna stay here, you'd have to pay the increased price. So that's where rent stabilization can be helpful. Um, even if the tenant's lease does expire, the landlord could only increase that rent by a certain set amount, which would allow that tenant to stay housed and to prevent them from um, hopefully being displaced. Um, next slide, please. So we understand that um, rent stabilization can't fix everything. It's not the answer to everything. So I also wanted to briefly discuss some laws that have been passed on the state level that are also um, hopefully going to impact tenants positively. Um, so specifically in regards to rent increases. So there is now, well, as a um, October 1st, 2023, there will be the requirement that landlords provide tenants with a written 90 day um, notice that their lease will, that their lease will be increased, I'm sorry, that their rent will be increased. Um, that 90 day notice provision is for year to year leases. Um, if a tenant is a month to month tenant, um, the landlord would still be required to provide 60 days um, written notice for any type of rent increase. Now, um, localities such as Prince George's County and other municipalities, they are still able to enact their own policies. But I think it's important to note that according to this legislation, um, counties that do enact rent st stabilization laws, they'll be required to report on the number of new housing, uh, multi-housing construction permits in, um, in their jurisdiction. And another piece of legislation that was passed on the state level that could also be helpful for our tenants uh, would be proof of rental licensure and actions to repossess. Um, this is essentially will help the, we believe it will help the, um, the landlord tenant process be a little bit more level. So currently landlords are only required to show that they have a rental license and a fair to pay rent case. So if they come to court and they file one of these cases, they're required to show their license for fair to pay rent. Um, they wouldn't have to do the same for tenant holding over a breach of lease case. 
Um, however, in October, they will be required to provide a license for all of these cases. And um, so that is another piece of legislation that will hopefully um, impact tenants positively. And next slide, please. And there's also a, um, in October, there will also be a rental assistance voucher program established by DHCD. And this will provide um, $15 million of rental assistance to people who are waiting for rental housing assistance um, or for the federal housing voucher program. So this is another policy that will help um, tenants who are um, potentially facing either um, displacement or eviction. And next slide, please. Um, so there are some collateral effects of rent stabilization. So one of the things that we have been seeing, which I think is important to note, um, our landlords, so, so although the county legislation is clear that landlords cannot charge more than 3% um, for certain tenants, what we're starting to see is some landlords are now charging new fees to try to circumvent that legislation. So these fees can be disguised as things like maintenance fees, pet fees, parking fees, utility fees. You'll often hear the tenants say, I've never been charged this before. Um, they've never seen these things. Um, and so we have been receiving more calls about these new fees. So essentially, although they're not charged, they're not increasing the tenant's rent, they are essentially still doing the same thing. It's just disguised as a different fee. And so although um, we may be able to argue against these additional fees in court um, in like a fair to pay rent proceeding, the concern also is um, the tenants could be bound contractually if they sign the lease agreeing to these fees. So that's something to think about. Um, another concern potentially is we may start seeing more landlords file um, tenant holding over cases. So if a tenant's lease expires, um, we could see um, landlords then try to increase their rent. And then lastly, just enforcement. Um, the enforcement authority is DPI. Um, once a landlord is reported to DPI, the concern is then um, what happens next? Will they act? Will the landlord actually be fined? And that would be the end of our presentation. And I think um, we have time for questions. Sure, thank you so much, Kayla and Jessica. Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes uh, to take uh, clarifying questions uh, from the work group uh, before we move on to CASA's presentation. And I'll get us started um, with um, a first question or two. Um, you brought up um, the uh, concern about uh, tenants who um, are receiving rental assistance um, and potentially not being protected by this policy. We had a lot of conversation uh, in the first session um, about uh, the potential effect um, of exempting subsidized, uh, any kind of subsidized housing. And we think of rental assistance, you know, as really sort of one of the best tools that we have um, for protecting affordability. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, what's the potential harm? Uh, what kind of scenarios could you see play out for uh, a tenant who is receiving rental assistance but not protected by this law? Sure, um, I think, and I think we're starting to see it now. So, um, if a tenant is receiving rental assistance, I think my primary concern would be that the rental assistance will cover what they currently owe. Um, but then moving forward, they may not be able to. So moving forward, if they receive rental assistance, they may not be protected by um, the rent stabilization bill, which would then mean the landlord could increase their rent by whichever amount they choose once their lease expires. So I think that would be um, the biggest concern that we have. And we see that already. We've seen tenants who have applied, who have received a substantial amount of rental assistance, but they still have had trouble catching up on the rent, even without the rent increases. So I think it would just, I think that would be my primary concern. 
I think the concern is if it's already slightly unaffordable for the tenant and they had to receive rental assistance moving forward, how will you maintain that sustainability for the tenant to be able to afford it if it's not stabilized? Yeah. Um, I see that uh, Ms. Cook from uh, Chair DeNova's uh, office has joined us, so I elevated you to panelists so you can ask your question directly. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we learned recently in my office that um, that the 3% uh, increase goes with the apartment, not with the person. Is that correct? I... I don't think I can confirm that. I didn't see that on the, um, I don't know if there's a clarification on the, the actual bill. Jessica, can you speak to that? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna double check because I know that there's a um, an info sheet. I'm not, I thought it was with the actual, um, you, the person that was currently renting that unit. Um, but give me a couple of minutes. I'm gonna look it up for hey, you. Yeah, please check. That's my understanding as well, uh, Jessica, but I would yeah, appreciate you checking. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, can I move to Aspasia? Uh, yes, thank you. And I Sorry, wanna... Director Zapolia. <laughs> no, no, Aspasia <laughs> sounds great. I do wanna clarify um, to your question, it is with the existing tenant. It is not with the apartment in this law. But I want to clarify some information that was provided on the rental assistance, because when we call, when we say rental assistance, it means very different things. People who receive ERAP were never excluded. What we always said was that permanent rental assistance, so either a project-based voucher or a tenant-based voucher. And that they are still excluded. And there is a science and a reason for that. It is because HUD establishes the maximum rent and HUD also says, what is the tenant's portion? The rest comes from the government. And so there are federal regulations that uh, clarify how this works. And so if a tenant's income doesn't increase, their rent doesn't increase, it increases only when their income increases and HUD determines what that is. And the maximum rent that is allowed is determined by HUD to the landlord and they can collect it, but it is covered by the federal government and it does help with operations. So I wanna clarify that because it is a very important point uh, as we make local laws to have them consistent with all other federal programs that are very valu valuable. And I also wanna clarify some information, Kayla, in your presentation, you said that CB51 uh, still has all the exclusions. It doesn't. The only uh, exclusion that exists now in CB51 is uh, for permanent, uh, for those who have uh, either a project-based voucher or a tenant-based voucher. And that is for the reasons I just explained. So for clarity purposes, I will put on the chat for everybody both uh, the notification we have in our website that we work with DPI and our Office of Law and the FAQs that are very clear who is excluded and who is not. But ERAP was never meant to be uh, excluded. It was not excluded on CB7, and it wasn't excluded on CB51 either. Sure. Ms. Cook, can I go back to you to see if you have another question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, in one of the earlier slides, it noted that if there was a UNO for a particular, I guess, apartment complex that I'm assuming that, you know, if there were a new owner in the last five years, that they were exempt from the 3% uh, rent stabilization. Do I have that correct? Yes, yes, that's according to the legislation. Okay, that's the first time I had heard that. So that it's that's interesting because we had a case um, where, you know, an apartment complex was recently bought and I would say in the last three years, we were not aware of that at all. So we were going under the assumption that, you know, these people had the right to, you know, that, yeah, they had the right to uh, expect to only pay a 3% increase, but that was incorrect, evidently. Well, I want to clarify too, that this is for new construction. So it's- Oh, not, new construction. Okay. Yes. It didn't say <laughs> Thank you very much for saying that. Thanks. Yeah, that was my question. Okay. Can I go to Ms. Lundy? Yes, thank you so much. Let me come on camera. I may be a little dark coming on. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Can't, 
Okay, hold on. Um, okay. Oops, sorry, I said have the NAACP. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right <laughs> thank you so much um miss campbell for your presentation it was very thorough um in one of your slides you talked about the notification of rent increases to be annually or uh, month to month so in my own case what um my landlord did was to um give us options so instead of giving taking the three percent like you said they disguise these fees so they have extended my term of my lease. So what, what are the parameters for those persons who are outside of the year lease, outside of the month to month, but they may be in 15 month lease, they may be in a 20 month lease. So I want us to consider that and do you have any feedback on that? Well, I think if your lease is for a set term, it would be considered a year to year lease. Um, usually month to month leases are if there is no set term. So if your um, lease has expired and you're just going month to month. Um, so in your case, um, so that legislation doesn't take effect until October of 2023. Um, but your lease probably still talks about um, how much notice the landlord would be required to give you um, to increase rent, but it may only be something like 30, possibly 60 days. And so the new legislation will possibly extend or increase the amount of notice that's required to be given by your landlord. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Powell. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Good, after, good evening, everyone. Thank you, ladies, so much for your presentation. Um, I just had a quick question, um, and it's from one of your earlier slides. And I'm sorry, I'm from Southern Management Companies, um, large presence in Prince George's County. So we're very invested in this issue. Um, but I've heard a lot about these increases that are well beyond a reasonable, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if there's been some sort of survey of apartment communities in the county to show whether this is, this is really an example of a few bad actors or if this is an issue that is wide sweeping across the county. Do we know at this point? I personally don't know um, about a large scale survey. I can only speak about um, the conversations I've had with our clients, our tenants who are experiencing the rent increases. Okay. Thank you. So let me um, thank you uh, all for uh, clarifying questions on this piece. I'm going to ask um, Kayla and Jessica to hang around uh, for the end uh, to take more questions. Uh, but at this time, uh, I'd like to move on uh, to the presentation from uh, Casa de Maryland. Um, and have um, Erica uh, and Jorge uh, present to us. And we'll do the same thing uh, after their presentation. We'll take uh, some clarifying questions and then we can open it up uh, for general discussion. So if I can hand it over to uh, Erica and Jorge um, and let them get started. Good evening, all. My name is Erika Puentes Martinez. I'm a research and policy analyst with CASA. My name is Jorge Benitez Perez. I am the lead organizer for Prince George's County with CASA. CASA is the largest immigrant and working class rights organization in the mid Atlantic region. Some may be familiar with our legal services. Our team has been representing folks in eviction court, helping tenants access rent support and other services but today we are going to focus on policy. We are here representing the interests of around 150,000 black and brown immigrant and working class families, many who are braving the housing affordability crisis. With a nationwide hike in rent paired with the not so coincidental skyrocketing homelessness rates and eviction rates, black and brown working class residents need strong tenant protections now. And of course, one of those tenant protections is a strong permanent rent stabilization bill or PGC. Opponents to rent stabilization, developers, landlords, frequently insist that the housing affordability crisis can be remedied if only the government minimizes interference in the market. 
government regulation through rent stabilization, they claim, would only discourage housing development, promoting issues with supply and demand. Firstly, we must address that myth. Rent stabilization does not have a negative impact on new construction. This fact is supported by numerous longitudinal studies conducted in jurisdictions included but not limited to Jersey, the Bay Area, Berkeley, Los Angeles, and nearby Washington, D.C. This is most likely as a result of rent regulation policies typically instituting carve-outs for new construction, just like our temporary CP7 includes. As you can see, these findings have been published in numerous journals. However, I ask the council to carefully consider the following. If, as opponents claim, the housing affordability crisis is a result of a market flaw, low supply, high demand, why would we turn to the market-based solutions to remedy this issue? In this case, their market solutions are to combat and or reduce any sort of rent regulations under the presumption that the market will sort itself out as if it were some sort of race into space. Yet history proves that the real estate market is far from race neutral. This market has been fueled by racial discrimination. It's helped craft racial segregation. And Prince George's County is no stranger to the racist practices of the real estate market. Many black and brown residents are still struggling to regain stability after the Great Recession of 2008 hit this county particularly hard. Financial institutions preyed on black and brown communities with high risk subprime loans. This predatory and racist lending practice shaped the housing collapse and left so many of our residents without homes. It didn't take long for private equity firms and Wall Street backed landlords to leverage our community suffering for their own gain, swoop in by hundreds of thousands of foreclosed single family houses and apartment complexes, which largely shapes our current day crisis. With investment firms targeting Black neighborhoods, buying a large portion of the housing stock nationwide to be turned into rental housing units, it significantly decreases any avenues for our communities to reach home ownership. As MacArthur Genius Fellow and housing scholar Keandi Amada Taylor simply puts, can't buy a house must be the rent, no matter how high. We are essentially dealing with a captive Black and brown renters market who are at the mercy of these corporate landlords. These corporate landlords, knowing they dominate the market, aggressively increase the rent. And here are just a few examples of what CASA has encountered in Prince George's County. The apartments listed on the slide vary widely in number of units. All of the apartments have raised rents over 10%. 10% is considered a constructive eviction, meaning it is an alternative way outside of the court process to evict residents. Some of these buildings have raised it through fees rather than rent. Fees include transaction fees, landscaping fees, administrative fees, playground fees, trash fees, month to month fees, amenity fees, parking fees, water fees, and utility fees when they were previously included in the rent. Now after CB7, these buildings are not are not including these items in rent and are tacking them on top of rent to bypass the bill. Most of these properties have out-of-state corporate owners. It is important to recognize that these aren't just studies or numbers. There are real people suffering the very real consequences. I will now pass it to three people who are residents from this list. Kia Jefferson, Magdalena Torres, and Eddie Mayorga. They are Prince George's County residents who have felt the effects of this injustice. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kia Jefferson, and I have lived in Laurel at Patuxent Place for the past 18 years. I received this time last year an increase of $800 more a month. That is a 56% increase. That is absurd. No one has ever heard of an increase that high. I, re I received my increase at nine o'clock at night via email and I only had 23 days to find a new place to live. I immediately went down to the rental office the very next morning to speak to them. And there was no 
there was no nothing. They, they, that was normal to them. They thought that an $800 increase with a 23 day notice was perfectly fine. I want to add that my unit has been occupied for 18 years. That means no renovations, nothing. They were charging me $100 less than the completely new renovated units. That means no new paint, no nothing. And their solution was, you can move into a temporary unit and then move back into a renovated unit. So now on top of an $800 increase, I'm asked to pay to move twice. There's just no, no reasoning behind that. So what does an $800 increase mean for the average person? Well, I figured if they're gonna charge me $800 more a month, I can go buy a house. So I ran out and got pre-approved and the house, the, the, the cost for housing, that was too much. So that, so that whammed me. So I was stuck, I was stuck there um, for yet another year. Now, technically my lease should start again in September. It's after July. I still have not received a new rent. Um, I still have not received a new lease. In this past year, they have raised the water um, and they are also threatening tr trash fees. Um, but $800, that is not a, let me, you know, work on my budget situation. That is a whole nother person. That's a, that's a whole nother person in my household um, to come up with that type of money. So I just wanted to share my story. So when you hear 200, 300, 400, no, there's people out here, 800, $1,000 in my complex. Thank you. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Eddie Mayorga. Good afternoon. Vivo en los apartamentos de Westgate en Laurel, Maryland, y soy miembro de casa. I'm sorry, can I interrupt just a second? Um, I think there's someone uh, translating for Mr. Mayorga, and you need to get closer to the uh, to the microphone as well. Thank you. Go ahead. La razón por la que estoy aquí es por la por la renta y los aumentos. Mi renta fue aumentada más de 100 dólares al mes. Soy de la clase trabajadora y un aumento así no es fácil para mí y mi familia. My rent was increased over $100 each month, and that is not an easy increase for me who is working class. Tengo hijos en la high school que me ven trabajar mucho y no pueden pasar tiempo con mi familia. My high school is children working all the time and, and wonder why I can't spend time with family. Yo he vivido en el condado de Prince, George, de Prince George alrededor de 20 años y no me gustaría irme de este condado. I have lived in Prince George's County for 20 years and I do not want to move from this county. Ya que toda mi familia y amigos están ubicados en este lugar y al salir de este condado implica dejar todo. My family, my friendships, everything that I've built in this county over the last 20 years are here and having to move means I give up everything that I've built. Ya que todo esto me ha costado por años construirlo, les pido por favor continuar protegiendo a la comunidad más vulnerable en este condado de Prince George. I have worked hard to build my family here in Prince George's County, so I ask that you guys continue protecting our vulnerable families here in the county. Y ayudarnos a pasar la estabilización de renta. And let's pass a rent stabilization law. Thank you. Buenas tardes. A mi nombre es Magdalena. 
y vivo en mi apartamento en Greenville por cinco años. Tengo una familia maravillosa con tres hijos menores de edad, uno de 18, de 14 y mi hija de 11. Good evening. My name is Magdalena and I live in Greenville. I have lived in my apartment for five years. I have a wonderful family with three children, one who is 18, the other is 14, and my daughter is 11. Debido al aumento en la renta, se nos ha complicado pagar las cosas como comida, medicamentos para mi esposo que acaba de tener una operación. Due to the increases in rent, it has made it difficult for us to buy here for our family. I'm sorry, we're having the same issue again where we can't hear the translation. We have had issues because of the rent increases paying for the bare necessities as food and even medication for my husband who recently had a surgery. Thank you. Yo me quedo en el hogar cuidando a mi hijo de 14 años que tiene necesidades especiales y necesita de mi cuidado. I stay home with my son who is 14 years old because he has special needs and needs of my care. Debido a los altos costos de la renta y en un accidente también de un árbol, uh, siempre ellos han tratado de aumentarnos. Nos llegó de 100 dólares más. Our last increase happened when we had an incident where a tree fell on our building. And even after the tree fell on our building, what we received was a $100 rent increase. Mi hija Allison ha visto cómo sufrimos esta pesadilla de los altos costos de renta. Ella quiso compartir unas palabras. My daughter Allison has seen how much we have suffered this nightmare of these extreme rent increases. And she wanted to share a few words. Hello, my name is Asin Torres. My family has lived here in Lima for almost five years, and I reached it the office. Hello, my name is Asin Torres. My family has lived here in Lima for almost five years, and I reached the sixth grade this year. I do not want to move from here, and I know that my parents and Casa are doing everything possible for us to stay here. And when I found out, that we were being kicked out of our house because the money was too much. I was scared because I left. I felt that we were going to live on the streets. I have my friends here and I have been here all my life and I was I, and I want to focus on school, not worry about where I live. Unfortunately, these aren't unique cases. The effects of these rent increases are not a result of just a few bad actors, but are rather part of an insidious nationwide trend. According to a congressional subcommittee report and expert panel from June 2022, while single family rental units provide great returns for investors, they have high eviction rates, poor maintenance, high hidden fees, and aggressive rent increases. Likewise, investment firms neglect maintenance and high rent and additional fees in apartment buildings to the detriment of tenants. Tenants just can't keep up. From 2000 to 2020, the share of renters who are rent burden increased from 41% to 50. This is affecting mostly black and Latina women. Rents have been going up more than inflation for years. As you can see in this chart, graphing pre-pandemic years in a local area, rent in red climbs higher than CPI in blue. Following a similar trend, Nationally, in recent years, rent in red continues to climb higher than CPI in blue. And locally, since the pandemic hit, rents have skyrocketed across the region. Rents in Prince George's County have gone up 14% over the past two years. Rent increases over 10% are considered constructive evictions, which means a lot of people have been forced out of their homes as a result of extreme rent increases. It is important to understand that there is a huge power imbalance between renters and landlords. CASA members cannot simply move to a cheaper apartment. They often sublease rooms to afford the apartment they are currently in. 
they often have no credit, so they cannot move to another property. They often don't have enough money to pay for the first month's rent and security deposit, not to mention the uprooting that moving costs to their jobs, their kids' schools, et cetera. Despite rent increases rising more than CPI over the last decade, this was not always the case. This chart shows how prior to the 2000s, CPI and rent increases went up almost the same amount. So why has that changed more recently? Could it be concentration of financing in an unregulated rental market? Could it be bigger profit margins for owners and landlords? Regardless, this shows the need for regulation in the rental market. Here is a graph of how rent burden families were in Prince George's County in 1990. Here is a graph of how rent burden families were in Prince George's County in 2020. As you can see, the percentage went up 14% over 30 years. Rent burden means that families are paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. Severely rent burden went up by 11% from 14% to 25% over that same time period. That means 25% of families are paying over half of their income towards rent. Clearly, we need a new approach outside of building more housing to protect renters. Before Prince George's County put a 3% cap on landlords, they were able to increase rents whatever they wanted to, even if their costs did not go up. Rent stabilization will require more investment in housing because only landlords that can show they are putting money into a property will be able to ask for the reasonable rate of return exemption. Permanent rent stabilization does not affect new development of housing. We absolutely need more housing and we need to incentivize building affordable housing with tax credits, housing trust fund money, et cetera. What we don't need is to lose affordable housing like it is, like it is happening across the Washington metropolitan region. We have seen rents go up by hundreds of dollars in numerous multi-unit apartment complexes. And we have seen fees from playground fees to administrative fees, to parking fees, to landscaping fees, to trash fees, tack on even more charges onto tenants. The situation is impossible for renters to continue to afford and we need rent stabilization to combat inequality and the racial wealth gap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will uh, take uh, just a couple of minutes to um, do some clarifying questions and then uh, sort of open it up for general discussion. And uh, I will uh, get started uh, with uh, my first question. Uh, the, you guys talked a lot about um, this issue about fees, uh, which was something that our panelists from Community Legal Services brought up as well. And I'm wondering if you can uh, just say a little bit more about uh, sort of what does that look like, um, you know, like once a tenant might get to an eviction proceeding. Um, if they've also got all of these fees uh, sort of piled up um, that um, haven't been paid. Yeah, so, you know, if they are in that eviction proceeding, what this means now is that their debt and what they owe is significantly higher than what it would have been if it was just, you know, the regular rent charges. Um, we've seen folks get water fees now added onto their leases and sometimes these water fees are in the triple digits. So imagine having that month to month as a charge on your rent, that can be a burden to many families. And I'll invite uh, other work group members to uh, turn on their cameras and or uh, unmute themselves uh, in order to ask any clarifying questions, but I'll ask another one, um, which is, um, someone posted um, in the question and answer um, about uh, sort of this issue of gouging. And I'm wondering if, you know, um, for you all, if there's a distinction 
uh, sort of between the two things, between this issue of gouging uh, versus a, you know, landlord uh, sort of charging moderate increases, um, you know, each year to cover their expenses and sort of where do you all, where do you draw that line if you do? Um, and how do you see it, you know, sort of being stepped over? Wait, Jorge, can you move closer? Yep. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there there is a distinction, right, in both. But what we want and what we're pushing for is for rent stabilization. Um, as we know, that is the purpose of this work group, right? It's a rent stabilization work group. And that is what we are going to push for. And that is what our communities, our CASA members have advocated for. Other members of the work group want to ask any clarifying question about the presentation from CASA. If not, I want to um, invite our other uh, panelists uh, from community legal services to turn their cameras back on, um, and maybe we can get into uh, some more uh, general questions. And uh, the question I want to start with um, goes back to a point that um, I think you both made uh, in your presentations, uh, which is um, about uh, sort of what the what the landscape looks like, you know, particularly for um, lower income renters um, in the county, sort of what they're facing and where a rent stabilization policy fits in, you know, with like how to, if I can uh, sort of say what I think, you know, like our collective uh, policy goals are, you know, which is to, you know, promote housing stability and to prevent evictions. Like how, how, how does this fit into that? What are tenants facing, uh, particularly lower income tenants and, and how does this policy fit in? So I, so once a tenant is evicted, they're more likely to continue to be evicted. So I think rent stabilization will make it hopefully easier to avoid the first eviction. Um, not only does the tenant face the eviction, once they are evicted, some of the management companies, if there's a lease term that's still outstanding, they may get sued, they may get sued for damages, some of the tenants get sued for eviction fees, so then they have a money judgment that follows them that can cause wage garnishments, and additionally other issues in the future in their credit, um, so rent stabilization hopefully can limit that, um, that from occurring. Also, the, the lack of affordable housing in the county is pretty substantial. Most of the clients that we're looking at live in a few of the apartments that are lower, are on the lower end of rents. Um, and if without rent stabilization, those are going to start becoming unaffordable for them. There's not going to be anywhere for them to really go. So I think rent stabilization um, can be effective in maintaining the units, the folks housed, but also maintain folks uh, paying their rent timely and avoid the additional costs that it costs the landlord to keep um, evicting, you know, the costs of evicting the tenants and that sort of thing. So I do think that it may be a win-win if there's some agreement amongst both parties. You brought up something and, you know, I remember hearing this statistic. Uh, it's been a long time ago now and I um, don't even know if I'm quoting it right, but I remember hearing the statistic that says something like, you know, once somebody is evicted, like they are likely to be evicted again, like within the next like two years or 18 months or something like that. Um, and so that the idea that it can be this kind of domino effect, um, I think is an important point to make. I don't know how long the time is between the yeah. two, and I don't know if the pandemic affected that. Mm -hmm. um, but there is that is a statistic. Once you've been evicted, you're more likely to continue to be evicted. Um, 
I want to continue to invite um, other uh, panelists to um, uh, come on camera and ask questions. I see Paul um, has got his hand raised. Paul, can I go to you? Uh, I'm sorry, you call me Carlos. I just put my Carlos, sorry. Yeah, yes, <laughs> <that's> okay. <laughs> Uh, a question about the, uh, I saw a lot of stats up here. Well, maybe we got but from the uh, CASA group. Um, does anyone have any stats that are going to break down between the bigger apartment complexes that tenants rent from, from the um, uh, smaller like townhomes and condos? Is there any kind of stats that have that distinction? Uh, because look at the CASA stats. I know y'all didn't bring those up, but those seem to be all apartment complexes. Or hey, or Erica, do you guys want to speak to the stats that you pulled? To answer, we don't have the stats on like compared to you know townhouses and stuff, but we have seen bigger increases in rent when it comes to corporate landlords. Okay, got gotcha. you. Thank you. And as far as the um, attorneys on uh, Kayla and Jessica, uh, the uh, clients that you're dealing with are there mostly from the apartment complexes and corporate owned as well? I would say I think the majority, yes. Um, yes, just because there's more of them, there's a lot more unit apartment units. And the data that we used is from the Maryland Judiciary um, Data Dashboard. It's the uh, administrative office of the courts. and there should be a more um, timely data dashboard, um, which should have started a few months ago, but unfortunately due to the way that failure to pay rent cases are filed, they're filed um, manually in paper, the court is still getting up to speed. There should be more additional, I guess, live data coming up. Um, it's called the uh, eviction da dashboard um, and that's starting to be populated. That's why our data is a little outdated. Um, it's just what's readily available for the judiciary. Okay, thanks. That helps give me an idea like the trends and patterns are like, because housing is so complex and nuanced and trying to see like where, where are the problem areas or probably the places where there's probably more problems than others just it'll help us identify it as we go through the work group. So thank you. Yeah, and Carla, someone brought this up uh, in one of the uh, question and answer, the comments and question and answer just about this uh, sort of difference between uh, small landlords uh, and larger ones. And I know uh, when the landlord uh, conversation happens tomorrow uh, in our prep, that was one of the topics that we um, uh, talked about covering as well, sort of, you know, the different types of landlords that are out there um, and, you know, um, should they be dealt with differently um, uh, in a policy. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to start uh, sort of uh, scrolling through some of the question and uh, questions that have been put in um, from uh, our attendees, uh, but other uh, members of the uh, work group should feel free to uh, chime in. Uh, there's a question here about um, if there are exceptions in the existing policy uh, for senior housing, um, I'll let uh, you guys chime in on that. I don't think unless it is uh, some sort of committed affordable uh, senior housing that there isn't anything, uh, at least in the existing policy um, for like senior housing as a category. And you guys can back me up on that if you know. You're correct. Uh, so unless there are two or two properties or with uh, project-based or tenant-based vouchers, they are not exempt. And this is part of our FAQs. Um, there um, was a, a question uh, or a stat uh, on the community legal services slides about um, the large number of uh, failure uh, to pay uh, filings. 
um, I think it was like 111,000 or something like that pre-pandemic. Um, and can you just clarify, um, is that, so that's not 111,000 households, that's landlords like filing multiple times on the same household? Like what, what makes up that number? It could be, it could be individual households where there's one case filed at one time, or it could be one household where multiple cases are filed. Um, so it's just the, the amount that's filed every year. That does not mean those cases go to trial. Some of those cases are dismissed prior to the hearing because the tenant pays. So some landlords rent is due on the first, it's late on the fifth, they'll file on the sixth. And at some point before the hearing, um, I think they're at right now in Prince George's County, maybe a month or two before the hearings are set, the tenant has in fact paid. So some of those cases don't go to trial and the case is dismissed prior to the hearing. Some of those cases do go to trial, but the tenant has the ability to pay and stay. So that's why while the filing are higher, the amount of actual evictions is not not as high as the number of cases that are actually filed. And this is a, you know, maybe a, a, a side, but related question. Um, the, to what extent do those tenants like come to court or come to the process with any kind of representation or are they for the most part representing themselves? So the great thing about our program is we provide same day representation. So if tenants show up and they are income eligible for our program, we will represent them at their land, uh, failure to pay rent hearing. Um, they can call ahead to, uh, to receive our services as long as they're income based. We have at least two or three attorneys available at each docket to represent them. Um, we have some Spanish speaking attorneys also that are there. Um, we do an intake, we review their documents. It's really helpful when the tenant shows up with their, their um, checks and anything else that has that they can prove that they've paid the rent. We review the filing to see if they have any defenses. Some of the defenses are whether or not the landlord is currently licensed. Um, so when the tenant does show up, there are services available to them. Um, some tenants unfortunately don't receive notice of the hearing until a few days before. Failure to pay rent um, service is different. Um, in most civil cases, the way that you're properly served is they serve you or somebody at your abode. Uh, or by register or by certified mail. Um, failure to pay rent cases, services, placement on the door to the apartment. Um, just because it's for a repossession of property, it's not for the actual money, um, especially in Prince George's County. Um, judges don't give any actual money judgments. It's for repossession of property. So you have to pay the amount of money that you owe in order to be able to stay and or redeem the property. Um, so service can sometimes make it difficult for tenants to show up, but if they do show up, there are services available. CASA also provides representation, um, as does Maryland Legal Aid. Um, there is the Access to Counsel program, which is funded by the, the Maryland legislature. We receive funding through the Maryland Legal Services Corporation. Tenants have access to counsel. It's different from right to counsel. Not every tenant will receive um, representation, but the goal is to hopefully help as many tenants as we can when they arrive at their hearing. So I want to clarify also, um, and I had asked this question uh, when the uh, CASA folks were up, but want to revisit with you as well, and it's regarding uh, the extra fees that Gets get charged and sort of what happens if a tenant ends up in court. I want to clarify: Can a landlord um, take a tenant to court, like based on um, not paying those fees, or is it only the non-payment of rent and then the fees come into play? So there's actually a appellate court decision, which is a 90-page uh, decision that discusses that topic specifically. Um, it's in the it's in the appellate court. It's been appealed to the Supreme Court of Maryland, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, we we our position is, which is what the court sided with, is that while a failure to pay rent is for rent specifically, so you look at the contractual terms. Rent is the the sum due every month, so the amount that's due over the twelve months, um, and 
that is specifically the only thing that can be filed in a failure to pay rent. Remember, failure to pay rent is solely for repossession of that property, so to evict the tenant. There is still that contractual obligation for the fees under the lease that can be revisited in a money judgment, in a, in a civil case. Um, and it's actually for Prince George's County purposes. If you have a civil case, it will be in the Upper Marlboro Courthouse. Any landlord tenant matters are in the Hyattsville Courthouse. It's just how the cases are divided. Um, so our position would be that the amount that can be charged on a failure to pay rent, so what's due and owing for the purposes of an eviction is what the actual rent is. It does not include those additional charges. And that's what our, our attorneys argue in the hearing. Some of the things that are included in a failure to pay rent is the late fee, which is only 5%. Um, it's only allowed to be 5% and any of the filing fees for the failure to pay rent case. So if the tenant um, loses their case and a judgment is entered because they, uh, they do owe the rent, in order to stop the eviction, if a warrant is filed, the warrant is what allows the landlord to come, the sheriff to come out and actually execute the eviction. The amount that's due will be on the warrant of restitution and that includes the $15 filing fee plus $5 per tenant. Um, and we, I clarified that in one of the chats. And then there's a $40 warrant fee. So that's all gonna be included um, when you need to um, redeem that failure to pay rent case. So it's two separate cases that are actually tend to happen in land, with landlord tenant cases. Hopefully that makes sense. The 90 yes. page, the 90 page uh, <laughs> appellate decision makes it clearer, but still um, not 100% clear. Uh, yeah, I just also, you know, wanted to, I agree with what Jessica said, right? These are technically not rent. So um, folks shouldn't be evicted for them, but unfortunately that's not what's happening in reality. Um, and that's why, you know, in this rent stabilization legislation, there needs to be something that addresses fees as well. So you're saying, so there are people who are being evicted based on not paying fees? So I think that comes up, especially if the tenant does not come in to court to represent themselves, or if there's the... It can occur if they're not represented. The tenant could come, the landlord could come in and explain with their ledger where the fees are. And it gets muddy when you're looking at a ledger and fees are being applied, rent is being applied incorrectly. Um, so I think representation is very important in that specific type of case. And I think that's what George was trying to say. He accidentally, yeah. he muted himself. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Um, and so then I guess, uh, particularly, you know, for the uh, folks that uh, CASA works with and represents, if you, you know, have folks who, you know, have language barriers or just like other work or other things going on, that there are lots of reasons why someone might not show up like on their own behalf. And I want to clarify that we're not saying that they can't collect those additional fees. Um, those that's for a different hearing. That's right. for a hearing before a judge on the on the, the contractual obligation from the lease, as opposed to right. The land, You're saying the that to pay rent your... for the rent purposes of eviction, right. those fees should not be included. Okay. Yes, I got it. Hopefully, everybody else got it too. Let me go to Shola. <laughs> Shola, you're breaking up a little bit. So I think Jessica just addressed what was supposed to be my comment, which is usually we reason there is a clause that says that any funds that are paid will be applied to cost imbalances irrespective of whether they are fees or actual rent. So I don't know. Hold on just a second, Shola. Yeah, can it, is anybody catching that? I want to make sure that it's not my connection that's breaking up. Shola, I don't know if you can um, put your question either in the chat or uh, in Q and A because um, I don't think we can hear you. Um, in the meantime, let me go back to Miss Cook.
You have your hand raised. I've got my hand raised. Sorry, I was trying to turn my camera on. We're, we're always told to have our camera on. So, um, oh, yes, I turned it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you missed my, uh, at the beginning, I think my uh, thing to the panelists to, you know, when not speaking to have mm -hmm. their camera on. Oh. Um, I can turn you back on. Though. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. um, that's why my camera on, was on for so long. Um, <laughs> so um, two things. Number one, if anybody in uh, on the Zoom meeting lives in District 1, which is like Laurel, Beltsville, you know, parts of Adelphi, uh, North College Park, um, we would be happy to help you, talk to you about the process um, and make uh, referrals. And then the second thing I wanted to ask is, did we get clarification about, you know, the uh, rent being, or the uh, 3% um, raise in uh, rent, uh, does that go with the individual or does it go with the apartment? So it goes with that individual renewing that, yeah. lease, that lease in that apartment. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I, it's on the... Uh, FAQs. It's specifically, I can send you the link I just went through. Mm -hmm. So this is what it says is a 3% rent cap apply to only current tenants. Yes, applies to tenants who are currently residing in their units who are renewing their leases during the effective period. Could I ask a, you know, dovetail on that? Because, okay, let's say that I'm living in a complex and I'm in apartment D, but I'm going to move to apartment A now. So that 3% is not going to follow me over to apartment A, and then I'm going to have to pay this huge rent probably on my new apartment. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Based on my reading of the, sta of the statute, that is correct. You're moving to a different unit, so it's a different mm -hmm. contractual, uh, okay. a different contract. And so so it's covering. for that individual in that apartment. Okay. Thank you. But I want to clarify, though, that if you rent apartment B and you rent it for whatever you rent it for, then the 3% then applies like thereafter. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't, you can't be guaranteed that like moving from A to B that, you know, B's rent is only going to be like 3% higher than A. Like you right. renting B at whatever they're renting B for. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I need to clarify that in our office. There's an interesting question. And the um, uh, FAQs that uh, Jessica is referring to has been posted um, in the chat, and I'm sure somebody will probably throw it up again um, in the chat so that it's easy to find. There's an interesting question in the Q&A about... Um, when rent and fees are bundled uh, into a balance and a tenant wants to make sure that their payments are going toward their rent balance instead of their fees, um, it, like how how to handle that? So Angie, that is, that is a really good point um, where, you know, I was mentioning, right, that folks have been evicted for fees and that's because landlords will, you know, misallocate that money for example, let's say a tenant owes $50 for rent and $50 for fees, and they pay $50, right, in hopes that it's going towards rent, but the landlord puts it towards fees, they can still be evicted for failure to pay rent. And they were trying, you know, to get caught up on rent, but instead the landlord chose to use that $50 for the fees versus the rent that was owed. I I think it also depends on how the landlord is filling out the complaints, um, because if we come across a tenant who is um, summoned for a fair to pay rent case, um, if there were any other, if there were any additional fees that were listed on that complaint, of course, we would argue that those have to be taken off. Now, of course, that doesn't remove them from the actual ledger, so that could be um, the landlord could file a separate action seeking like. Um, contractual damages or something like that, a civil case. But for the purposes of an eviction hearing, we would always argue against that. Um, even in some landlords, they'll say, well, you know, they disagree with us, but we say that the rent payment should be applied specifically to the rent. And that is what the, the court is concerned about. And I think that just goes into the importance of legal representation. We're able to identify those, those fees that shouldn't be included. 
All right. Any last questions uh, from members of the work group? I'm scrolling uh, through the uh, questions in the Q and A, and I think we've hit on a lot of these topics. Um, as we start to wrap up, um, I just I want to thank uh, Community Legal Services and CASA uh, for uh, talking to us about um, this issue. I think there are a lot of um, issues that. Um, were raised um, about the tenant perspective that hopefully gives the work group uh, some fodder for the kinds of things that we want to uh, dig into over the next year, the kinds of things that we may want uh, our consultant to collect more data about um, so that we can, you know, really figure out uh, what are the types of protections um, that uh, can and should feed into a permanent policy. We will be back uh, tomorrow evening um, for the last of these early fact-finding sessions. Uh, we will be back tomorrow uh, with uh, the um, Apartment and Office Buildings Association, or better known as AOBA, um, and several of their members to talk about this issue uh, from the landlord perspective. You know, one of the difficult things um, that I think the work group uh, will have to do um, is to really uh, balance um, in their recommendations, you know, this uh, issue of uh, how we have good uh, housing policy uh, in the county um, that promotes housing stability, that prevents evictions, that promotes affordability, um, but then also, you know, how we make sure um, that uh, landlords have the resources that they need um, to uh, keep their buildings up. Um, and so uh, these sessions are, and as I said, fact finding and an effort to uh, sort of put a lot of issues on the table early um, so that as we dig in, uh, we can take these different perspectives um, into account. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, folks are signed up. Uh, for our session that's taking place uh, tomorrow night. Um, and then I said this in, at the beginning, if anyone missed it, um, the work group is going to officially uh, begin its work soon. Uh, and as part of the work group's official work, uh, we will be hosting uh, some more sort of town hall uh, type sessions uh, that will give the members of the public um, a chance to weigh in um, again um, on these topics. Um, but we wanted to do these sessions as a way of uh, really giving the work group uh, a chance to start to dig into the work. So with that, um, I think we are going to uh, end uh, for this evening. Please keep a lookout um, for uh, our posting of uh, the slides uh, from this evening, as well as uh, the video from this evening should continue to be available uh, for anybody who wants to watch it again, um, or for others who may have missed it, um, uh, to tune in later uh, to hear this dynamic conversation. Uh, so thank you to our panelists, uh, and hopefully I'll see all of you tomorrow night.